Hello everyone, welcome back to OC Recovery's YouTube channel. Today I have a video that I have titled, Five Things That Hold Us Back on the OC Recovery Journey and in or Life. So some of these aren't just directly entailed to OC Recovery, but a lot of them do have a lot of overlap. So I'm going to break down each point in my opinion on why these things hold sufferers back. A lot of them are very prominent in our community. And then a lot of these attributes in life, these perspectives on life, hold people back into the comfort trap. Again, there's nothing inherently wrong with comfort, but it usually doesn't get people where they want to go in life. So before you go any further, you please subscribe down below. Lots of great videos going up on the channel. Kirsty's back from her wedding and she wasn't feeling well. Momin, I've been trying to convince Momin to do some more videos because I think his videos are fantastic. Um, there's a lot of videos by myself and hopefully some of the other moderators as well will make some more videos soon since I think it's very important to see perspectives from other people in this journey. So as I said, so the title of the video is five things that hold us back or don't help us in life and on the OC recovery journey. The first one we've talked about a lot, but I really want to break it down. Worrying about other people's perspective on OCD. Now, when you read the books on the reading list and when you practice cognitive behavioral therapy or REBT, rational mode of behavioral therapy, and you start to live life in a way that is more rational or deemed from more of a Greco-Roman philosophy perspective, such as stoicism, you start to realize that a lot of the things that people worry about in the way that they worry about them is really hindering your life. This is why the book, The Myth of Self-Esteem, is so important. There's a huge difference between myth of self-esteem, self-esteem is always conditional based on a condition, or self-acceptance, unconditional self-acceptance, other in life acceptance, is based on unconditional. Remember, that doesn't mean you have to agree with the act or you know like whatever's going on, but you could learn how to accept its presence, which brings down an extreme amount of suffering in itself. So there's a lot of people out there who um, make memes and make jokes and um, tell you and portray that, you know, OCD shouldn't be used as an adjective and all these other things. Well, the reality is it's a waste of time. And I'm going to tell you why. When you put a large majority of your focus on what other people are thinking about you, you live in the world of which will be point four, deservingness and fairness, which we're going to talk about that a lot as well. So, we don't need anyone to understand us. But what you do is when you make these posts and you make these memes and you demand it, again, the demand must, oughts and shoulds, you are, you are thinking in your mind subconsciously that other people must understand where you're coming from. If they don't understand, if they just understood, it will make things easier. It's not going to make anything easier. If nobody understood your OCD or your weird fear, if you had some off weird fear, it's all OCD is OCD is OCD. Kirsty did a great video that came out yesterday or two days ago talking about how themes can be beneficial for looking at the particular fears, but OCD is OCD is OCD. There's a fear cycle going on. There's compulsive behaviors that are running that fear cycle. There's irrational beliefs that are running that fear cycle. There is a lack of behavioral change that's running that fear cycle. So it's a mixture of a bunch of different things. So we don't need anyone to understand us. And I don't spend one second of my time trying to convince. So trying to convince someone with demanding this and shooting them shows a lack of unconditional other acceptance and unconditional self-acceptance. It's very hard to see that because this is the way that most people, I have to prove you wrong. Trying to prove someone wrong automatically at the tin is conditional other acceptance. You don't accept them and even if they don't agree with you. Now you can have a conversation with someone on, on anything and not agree with them and you don't have a need to try and convince them of your cause. Um, we get some kickback about that. I get some kickback about how they're like about the OCD stuff. Now, I'm just telling you what works for me, what I see work anecdotally, what the literature says, uh, what things don't work and so forth. But we don't need anyone to understand us. We would prefer, we could prefer for someone to understand us, family, loved ones, and friends, but we don't need them to. And when we, when we believe that we need them to, we are just setting ourselves up for absolute disaster because it again, shows us that we need to put the recovery process of ourselves in the hands of other people. I see this all the time with people I'm friends with that have addictions. They're trying to get other people to understand them or other people help them. That can only bring... So number two, I get major kickback on this and I'm going to break it down as best as I can in my perspective. So <laughs> putting too much focus on mindfulness. I know many people... OCD and not who practice mindfulness that don't make any active changes in their life. Mindfulness can be a major comfort trap. Mindfulness has benefits. 
Um, the major thing I don't agree with the mainstream media perception and people that write books on mindfulness is that, you know, all you have right now is the present moment. That's absolutely true. That's a factual statement. What's not factual is that other points don't matter at all. Take me, for example, as a business owner. Take anyone who's a business owner. You will be thinking in the future. You don't have to worry about it with extreme worry, having chronic anxiety, but maybe some frustration, maybe some just general awareness of what's going to happen in the future. Anyone that's portraying to you that the only thing that matters right now in life at this moment is the very moment you're living does not understand the reality of life, in my opinion. Um, I have never forcefully practiced mindfulness one time in my entire life. Never. Not once in my whole entire recovery journey. And I have made tremendous leaps and bounds. I have seen people that have forcefully tried to use mindfulness. If I'm present in the moment, if I just be present, everything will go away. No, because you're still scared of something. And mindfulness can become its own compulsive behavior. You're so forcefully trying to stay present in the moment, it's not doing it for you. This is the reality of mindfulness in a rational statement from Stoicism and REBT. Being mindful is being present of the moment with having no judgment on the moment. Sometimes you'll be present and sometimes you won't. You might be at work doing a patient note. Maybe you'll be doing some taxes and your mind will be at the beach. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. That is mindfulness. Anyone telling you that not being present in the moment is a problem is setting you up for absolute disaster. Can it be slightly problematic at times if you're not you know, focused at all? Sure, but you could still accept that about yourself and work on being more aware in the moment. But to think that the moment is the only thing that matters, good luck being a business owner. It's never gonna happen. This is not even just business owners. Other jobs where you have to think about you know, the future or stuff like that. Maybe you're a nurse and you're thinking about, you know, medication distribution later on in the day. Oh, none of that matters. I have to live in the moment right now with no judgment. It's not reality. It's never going to be reality. It's a blissful statement that actually doesn't change any behavioral changes. It also doesn't give you a framework. The biggest problem with mindfulness is it has no framework whatsoever for unconditional self-life and other acceptance. This is where the only thing where Rob and I probably, we don't butt heads, but we don't see it maybe eye to eye like we do on other things. Uh, mindfulness can be important. I know Rob does like mindfulness probably a little bit more than I do. I think it's a buzzword, um, and I don't think it's as beneficial as people think it is. Um, I probably have a little bit of a biased view on that, and I can admit that, and I'm willing to have a conversation with anyone. But if you've been practicing mindfulness and trying to be present and forcing the moment, you're more than likely holding yourself back, and it is something you'll have to think about. Number three, rating your identity with something. This is where the myth of self-esteem comes in. We know humans are extremely good at one thing. They rate their entirety with something. So let's say they do a bodybuilding show and they do well. I'm going to use personal examples from people I know. And they do very well. And they get this huge boost of conditional acceptance. Everyone's commenting. Everyone's congratulating them and everything. And then when that starts to die down, the mood starts to die down. Because the praise isn't there anymore. It's very conditional. You are not a bodybuilder. You are a person that lifts weights and likes to compete. You are not a competitor. You're not the person that you attach your identity to. This is the biggest downfall to human beings. By far sets up the most amount of emotional problems by believing that self-esteem is real. Self-esteem can have benefits for short-term stuff, for working at success, building up your emotions, but long term, you want to choose unconditional self-acceptance, life and other acceptance versus self-esteem. You don't need to do X to feel Y. Again, there are some benefits. The myth of self-esteem does play it out. It's not that self-esteem has absolutely no benefits because it does. But long term, it doesn't have the benefits you think it does. So we rate our tasks. Task perfection can be very beneficial. It pushes us in the right direction. It can create, um, you know, honesty. You know, not that humans are honest all the time, because that would, I think would be irrational as well. It pushes you in the directions to create a better frustration tolerance and all these other beneficial things for long-term view, viewpoints and long-term perspective shifts, not just immediate changes. So there is no such thing as a good or bad person. It's, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. If someone does 100 acts in one year deemed good and then they you know accidentally trip someone and that person oh you're a bad you didn't hold the door for me you're a bad person so they ha there's no way to quantify what's a good or versus bad person because good traits and bad traits are not viewed the same way in different cultures and societies so who's to say anyone's right we just have traits 
that they're either healthy or unhealthy from our perspectives or what we've seen anecdotally and in the research. And then we have cultural beliefs and environmental beliefs and backgrounds that, that dictate on why society sees like that. We see murder as a heinous act. There's other places where cannibals, they viewed murder and human sacrifices as a way to, you know, to praise to the gods. It's, a, it's just not as straightforward as this person's good and this person's bad. If it was, things would probably be a lot easier for our psychology. But the reality is they're not. Number four, thinking life is fair and you deserve things and looking at how lucky we are to live in this time period. We have a major problem in society right now, okay? A major, almost victim mentality problem where people believe, truly believe cold-heartedly that they deserve everything and that life is supposed to be fair. Whether this is a money concept or a religious concept or a political concept or anything. The reality is, most things that you think affect your life don't affect your life at all, almost at all. It's a blown out catastrophizing uh, way to make things seem more real. Um, uh, Douglas Murray has a good book that I've read uh, excerpts from called Madness of the Crowds that Rob introduced me to. And it shows why people like to go with the crowds. People don't like being looked at or being rejected. People are fearful of rejection and stuff like that. But the thing is, when you realize that nothing is fair and you don't deserve anything, if deserveness and fairness were cons considerable universal concepts, kids would not die of cancer, people would not die in car accidents and head-on collisions with their family and their kids dying, all these horrendous acts you see as misfortunes or, or just terrible events would never, ever happen. Because everyone would need to agree on what is considered what someone deserves and what someone thinks is fair. And you could ask a hundred different people and their definition, their subjective definition of fairness will differ from person to person. There will be overlaps, of course, but there will be major discrepancy differences in all of these people. So it's not as simple as there's a fairness and a deservingness type concepts out there. We can prefer it back to one, worrying about what other people think. We could prefer it. It would be nice if they understood us. It would be nice if life was fair and deserving things. I'm not saying the concept of fairness and deservingness is an understandably, um, you know, something that you you would strive for because it makes sense in a human, um, just, just evolutionary responses. But the reality is, is it's not. There is no such thing as fairness and deservingness. We can only prefer it, but we don't need it. And then number five. This is an important one because we've talked about it a lot, Rob has, and we see it quite commonly, and that's getting better from OCD and running away. Now, you don't need to do what I do, <laughs> okay? I thoroughly enjoy this. I also was um, gifted, you know, in a way you could say. Uh, I can speak well. Um, I don't use a whole lot of filler words. I can basically talk to anyone and make anyone seem like my friend, and I just, I'm that type of a person, so the... For me to make videos for this channel, I think is a good idea because sometimes a lot of people don't feel comfortable in front of cameras or I don't have a problem with that whatsoever at all. I like speaking in front of people. I was a tour guide for years. I really liked that in my summer job in New Jersey. So when people get better, they run. And I think one of the most important things you can do, and you don't need to do this, no one needs to, is sharing your story about what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Because then people that don't know, get you know, put yourself in their shoes. They have no fucking clue what they're doing. They have no idea. So when someone comes to me and they're freaking out and in your mind you're saying, oh my gosh, this person is being ridiculous. Just think, you were, I was that person two years ago. I was crying every single day, sleeping, highly suicidal, tried to jump out of a car, was in a mental hospital. You forget what it was like to be suffering. I was just talking to this about someone the other day in a phone call and I said, when you're on, I got this from Rob, when you're on top of Everest for say, you can only imagine what it's like to, fe to feel warmth, be on the beach. It's a faint memory because you're so cold. When you're so sucked into OCD, whether it's, you know, unwanted intrusive thoughts, images, sensations, urges, physical chronic, chronic manifestations of anxiety, it's hard to imagine what life is like beyond those feelings or what it was when you were six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old if you didn't have OCD at that time frame. Um, even though at the chronic OCD level, like all of us, we definitely had OCD subclinical tendencies more than likely our entire lives. So that's a very important thing to talk about. Um, when you run from OCD in the way that, ooh, I can't go anywhere near it, I I'm going to relapse, that is still a fear. Remember, unconditional life acceptance means you could talk to anyone about any fear and have no worry that you will be latched again because you accept yourself under all conditions. This is so important. This is why we talk about unconditional self-life, other acceptance. It's why we talk about the difference between agreement versus acceptance, uh, self-esteem versus self-acceptance, and all these other things. 
I hope you enjoyed this video so much. Here, see how much more calm it is when I have only had like one coffee in the day and not 700. So thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe down below and have a great day.